You can't be autistic. You give eye contact. You cannot be autistic. You have a sense of style. You cannot be autistic. You live a really normal life. I'm not even lying to you guys. These are actual phrases that I have heard when I have told people in my life. Wait, you know who she she looks like? Doesn't she, she kind of looks like Selma Hayek, right? Like a little bit, a little bit like Selma Hayek, which obviously is a compliment. Selma Hayek is a beautiful lady. Doesn't she kind of look like Selma? Am I crazy? Life that I'm autistic. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alina and I was diagnosed with autism at age 25. And since getting the diagnosis, I'm now faced with this sometimes uncomfortable situation where I need to let people know that this is the reality of my brain. The reason that this can. Ooh, I like that she said the reality of her brain. Love the language. All uh, I love the language already. Okay, we love this. We love the aesthetic. Good aesthetic. Can sometimes be an uncomfortable and awkward thing for me to share. It's not because I should be ashamed of my brain itself. It's because most of the time, like ninety percent of the time, the people that I'm telling had no idea beforehand that there was even an inkling that I was autistic. In fact, right now at this point in my life, I'm currently job hunting, and I'm in this kind of tricky situation where I need to weigh up whether I tell the employers that I'm autistic and could possibly face judgment and- Ooh, ooh, this is tricky. This is tricky. Mm. Ooh, this is tricky. This, this is what's hard about living in a world like in America. It's very tricky telling your employers you struggle with anything because even it is, it's just like a weird game. You know, it's hard to tell people and look, people are people even in business. I think we forget regardless of how professional you seem, you're just a person. So it's like you can be messy. I'm sorry. I'm watching this realtor show I told you about the one in New York. It's so messy. Like people who work at the same company doing podcasts about each other and naming names and complaining about each other. Like I'm sitting here like, oh, and like these are real people with real like real jobs. They're not just like paid actors. They just happen to have a camera there. And I'm sitting here like, sir, people can see this. And it's so interesting how people play those games, but it's so normalized. Like drama is so normalized. So when you tell an employer that you have a disability or something, it's not just a risk to your job. It's a risk to coworkers gossiping about you. It's a risk to people thinking you're less capable. I mean, in some ways, the only way you would, the only reason you would tell them you're autistic or have a disability of some kind, like fibromyalgia or something, is to be accommodated. So in some ways, maybe people would start to imply you're not as, quote, good of a worker. But at the end of the day, that's why we have to ask ourselves what kind of a business work-life balance we want. Obviously, I'd prefer to live in a world where we could be accommodating without sacrificing sort of our goals. But when money is your God, well, there you go. So this is a difficult thing to do, okay? discrimination and then subsequently not getting the job or do I not share with them get the job and risk burnout after mm. six to 12 months because I've been masking the entire time the reality is because I don't look autistic to the world it's up to me to communicate to everybody and risk their judgment. In fact, I'm sure that a lot of you guys could actually relate to my experiences on this. When I've told people that I'm autistic, oftentimes it's met with confusion or maybe it's almost embarrassment because maybe they feel as though they should have picked it up beforehand or maybe they don't know anything about autism. So maybe they've got this blank stare when I tell them like they have no idea what that means. But with a lot of the responses, they try to some degree to make me feel better and remind me that everyone's just on the spectrum in some way. Everybody on this planet. <laughs> okay, wait, I said that. Okay, so I have people who come into my audience sometimes and I'll say things like everyone's on the spectrum and they think I'm, they think I'm being serious and I'm not just like saying that as like kind of a joke, like everyone's gay. You know how I'm like everyone's gay, like everyone's autistic. I'll have people come into the audience who are like, I hate Brittany Simon. She says everyone is on the spectrum. But like, I don't mean that. I'm kind of memeing on 
the se- like the, obviously not everyone is on, like that would be impossible for everyone to be on the spectrum in the same way it's impossible for everyone to be gay so if, so i'm memeing but they can't tell that i'm memeing probably because they're on the spectrum but like they can't tell that i'm memeing and it's c- kind of funny it's it's a bit wee funny in it and it may be able to read the symptoms of autism and be able to find some correlation to their own brain. But what makes a brain neurodivergent or autistic is the severity in which these symptoms present and how they impact the individual's life. Maybe you guys know or maybe you don't. I am somebody who is definitely trying to get involved in the autism world because I truly do feel with my entire being that this is where I'm meant to be, that this is what what I was put on this earth for, that this is what all those years, those 25 years of struggle were for. Wait, is she 25 now? Did she say her current age? She was diagnosed at 25. Is she still 25? That's what I'm creating this content for, is to allow people to hear and resonate with my experiences. And that's what I have been finding. And amongst trying to, I guess, build a career in the autism world i really had to understand who are the people that i am trying to connect with in all of this in my words in my storytelling and i think that's changed over the course of the last few months but recently i've realized that the people that i am trying to connect with are those that still feel even with a diagnosis or even coming to terms with the fact that they could possibly be autistic they still feel as though they don't fit in what i mean by this is Before you get diagnosed or before you come to the realization that autism is a thing, you go through your life feeling like an alien, feeling as though you've missed out on the handbook that everybody else got. And then you stumble across autism or you get a diagnosis and then all of a sudden it makes so much sense and you realize that you're not as fucking crazy as you thought you could be. And so then you start as the years go on after coming to this realization, you start to kind of unpack your life and you start to involve yourself in a bit more of a neurodivergent community. Or at the very least, you start educating yourself online and you start to see other people. It's really interesting. Uh, I noticed I noticed that there's a huge difference between my neurodivergent friends that do not hang out with neurodivergents and my neurodivergent friends that ex- like almost only hang out with neurodivergent people. And I noticed there's a lot more judgment, I think, from my neurodivergent friends that hang out with more or less neurotypicals. Maybe they're working in corporate or maybe they're working in like a team kind of business. You know, they're they are working, first of all, that's important. So there is a little bit of maybe they'll like if they're autistic, let's say, and 80 percent of people who are autistic aren't working full time or have a job, then they're probably not running into other people with autism. Right. So they're the lone person in the corporate building who has autism, who's, you know, competing with those other people. So there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a disconnect versus if you're working with a bunch of people who are autistic, ADHD, neurodivergent in general, and they're working at community building, you know, kind of bubbles, they're in community building kind of bubbles, or they're just working with people, or or maybe socializing, I should say, I shouldn't say working, socializing with people who are on the spectrum or neurodivergent in general, who are unemployed. And then that's a different kind of support system. And I do see a difference between the different kinds of friends I have. And then the third category of neurodivergent friends, or let's say acquaintances that I have, that are sort of like me, where they're independent workers, they work strictly for themselves, they work every day to keep their business afloat because they can't work a nine to five or a normal corporate job, and because they can't afford to be unemployed. And that's gonna sound judgmental, nobody can really ever afford to be unemployed, right? But there is sort of a, actually, I think that's a complicated conversation maybe we'll have for another time. I think that's interesting, that there is a difference between the communities and what kind of support they get and what kind of expectations they have for one another. So there's a lot of judgment that can come into that, like a lot of internalized ableism, or more than that, a little bit of judgment, I think, that they're projecting because they don't know the differences versus working in a neurotypical place as a neurodivergent or working with neurodivergence. Like the energy is so different that the one couldn't fathom the other. Does that kind of make sense? Anyways, to hear her say that she wants to work with, in the communities with people who are autistic, that's interesting. Just pointing it out because I thought it was, I don't know, it stood out to me.
who also have the same thing that you have. And in my experience, what I've found is that I am struggling to relate to a lot of people who are autistic. In a lot of the content now that calls for inclusion and accessibility for hidden disabilities, the kind of autistic people that are portrayed in these photographs or in these movies, in these books, in the media are very bold and colorful, just extremely loud and proud to be themselves. And I love that. I love seeing that. I am absolutely in no way hating on that. I think it's incredible. The problem is, in my case, is that still not me. I'm not this loud, proud, colorful kind of person. In fact, I'm probably the plain Jane of the autism world where you can't- Um, I don't know, bro. Your decor says otherwise. Am I crazy? Well, maybe she means her personality. Because her decor ain't beige. It's green and orange and pink and green. And there's like 20 colors in this room right now. Is she mean her personality? Does she mean her personality? I don't really gauge much about me. And I'm extremely shy and oh, okay. introverted. I okay, so she means her personality more or less. Don't see that often presented now in anything. The plain Jane. So now I still don't quite fit the mold of the neurotypical expectation. I made- She meant neurodivergent expectation. She put a correction on her screen for those who aren't physically or ver visually watching. This reel a few months ago now, it was really just trying to find- Here's to- the, I'm gonna read her reel. She said, here's to the late- here's- to the late to the party autistic girls who are considered too to be too weird to fit into the neurotypicals but also don't fit in social society's preconceived stereotype of an autistic person because you wear makeup give eye contact so people think you're trying to be trendy with an autism diagnosis so okay I doubt if this was kind of normal feeling within the neurodivergent world and i've come to learn that it is and that's extremely exciting for me and these are the kinds of people that I really want to connect with. I'm sure that there have been points in time where I've met people and they think that I'm faking being autistic or they believe that I really need to have a label in order to feel mm. like I fit in with sure. the rest of the world because that is something that I've heard, you know. Older people saying, oh, young people these days just need to have a label to fit in. It's like, mm, this label actually saved my life, hun. But the funny thing is, Although to these people, most of the time I think I look like them living in a neurotypical world, the reality is I'm actually masking my neurodivergent brain to look neurotypical. And they just can't see that because they can't see into my brain. If somebody has a prior notion of what autism is and they themselves are not autistic, most of the time this idea comes under the very typical autistic traits. The individual is often diagnosed as a toddler or a child. Parents were no doubt alerted to the differences in the child with their perhaps delayed speech, non-verbal communication, repetitive behavior or avoidance of touch. The child no doubt had big outbursts, you know, self-harming behavior. The child probably struggled to transition between activities and tasks. The child no doubt found a change of routine or environment deeply troubling. The funny thing is, is that this is the typical autistic traits of a child. And I've related to a lot of these, but I think where things go a little bit different and why I don't present in these ways the typical autistic traits anymore is for one, I'm a female and females, there's often this heavy burden from society that you've got to shape up and catch up with everybody else. Whereas I think boys are often given a lot more leeway. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay. Because I'm really trying to hear her. So here's what I think this is more than anything. And here's what it's felt like for me my whole life and probably for a lot of you of your whole life. When you don't fit into the bubble, you feel like there's not a place for you because it's not just about being autistic or being neurodivergent or being queer or being anything. It's also about the bubble. Queer people, autistic people, all these, they're not monoliths. And so every bubble represents them differently. Every bubble has a different relationship with the word. And if she found the right bubble, she'd find her people. But then ultimately, especially if you're more of an introverted person, your people might just be person, right? So I understand this lived experience. I think a lot of us have probably had it where we don't quite fit in. Like I always joke like, 
yeah, I'm never quite enough for any bubble, which is why I ended up forming a bubble, right? So form your own bubble and then be a bubble hopper. Be a community person that hops in and says hello, but doesn't like live there 24 seven. Because when you live somewhere 24 seven, you have to really vibe with the whole bubble. You got to fit in, right? There's an element of fitting in because it feels like home to you. Think about the people that only work like, uh, if you watch Queer Eye, you know, Queer Eye, there's an episode of, multiple episodes actually, of them following female teachers. And these teachers like live and breathe their school districts. They live there for 30, 40 years. They work in the school district. Everybody knows them. This is what they do day in and day out. That is a person who has found a bubble. That is a person who vibes with a specific place and they're doing great things for their communities. They are a staple in the community but they never had to leave their small town. They never had to do anything else. And I think that's beautiful. And that's what you've got to do. So if you, you know, end up having this sort of dilemma, which I think I've had, you've had, you know, we've all, someone's, you know, someone's going to have this lived experience. If you're in this category, you got to find people that are either similar, but understand that a lot of those people are also very independent. I think there is a, just a reality where you're probably going to end up hanging out with people that are very independent in some ways. If you don't like, perfectly fit into the mold of an expectation, right? So you know what I mean? I, I think she's she's saying something that's important. I think uh, for the chatter who said it earlier that she reminds them of Kidology maybe, yeah, like Kidology needs to make a bubble, right? Like she's gonna be a person who I think makes a bubble. I think to feel deeply understood means knowing yourself well enough to know whether or not you need to make a bubble or find a bubble. But also because I wasn't given a diagnosis, as a child, it meant that there were no answers. So there was Mm. no reason for me to be having these issues. So I just had to get on with it in order to survive. So how does autism show up in my life now as a 28 year old woman? Well, although I'm not naturally a very sociable person, I think that I do a really good job at imitating and masking sociable behavior. In fact, I've been told that I am one of the best maskers that friends have ever seen because I can mask neurotypical behavior mm, to a T. I was not overly clever Mm. at school. I think that I was kind of just sitting where everybody else was. I wasn't under, I wasn't above everybody. I was just, you know, coasting along nicely. I love routine and this has been present since the day I was born. (sighs) Tori said something really really profound, really. Autism directly affects your personality, though. Learning this later in life gives you a new perspective of your entire life. It's actually pretty debilitating for some people. You know, there's this, always this conversation we're having about the real us, the core us, the true us. And I think when you recognize, and I think this is why even like determinism is so scary for people, whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter, right? What matters is this idea that we might be a way because of something is scary because the question is like, what's that something? And so you look at your personality and you realize like, I was just born this way. I think everyone is just born the way they're born. And I think some things are learned and that's absolutely like something you can deconstruct, but I don't think I can deconstruct my personality. I've been this way for as long as people have like vouched for me. And I've been this way, like they say out of the womb, like my personality, like the way I talk, the way and sentences of the period, the way I like move around. I was born also into like a Middle Eastern family. We're all very blunt, very bold. So then the, it begs the question, is it genetic? Is it like an, a Middle Eastern Arab thing? Or is it we're all neurodivergent? Or is it all we're just all genetically connected? So we have this thing. Either way, it's about knowing yourself and knowing like what parts of me just are and what parts of me do I want to deconstruct? And I think we even have this with our physicality, like our faces, right? Like, do do you want to be a person that changes the way you physically look to be perceived differently? Is that going to make you see yourself differently? And that's why plastic surgery is always up for debate on whether or not it's really for you or for people. Like, do you need to get this nose job to see yourself 
in a way that makes sense for how you internally feel? Or are you doing it so people perceive you differently and treat you differently based off of it? And either is a good answer. It's just as long as you know the answer, I think that will really help. I think videos like this are very helpful because they're really just brainstorming. She is truly just brainstorming for us and it gives us the ability to brainstorm for us. What does this mean? How does this relate to me? What's the real me? And also even masking is such an interesting thing. It is such an interesting idea, especially if you're bubble hopping all the time because every time you bubble hop, there's a change of what's normal. If I'm in a progressive bubble, I will say things that signal to them I'm friendly. Like gender's a construct, right? If I'm in a conservative bubble, I'll signal to them things that are friendly. Like everyone should have the, you know, right to the second amendment or second amendment something, but also I would love some version of gun control. It's like, oh, they know I'm liberal, but also that I'm not afraid of guns. I'm just afraid of people who use guns. <laughs> You signal to the people around you. And then when you come home and you ask yourself, okay, like who am I for real though? What do I think about this? How do I think about this? Why do I think about it this way? Why do I perceive myself this way? Why am I using these particular words to, to explain how I think about myself? The you that is you and the you that is in the community is just a different you. But what routine actually allows me to do is it, it allows me to pave the way for a successful career, meaningful relationships, and honestly, a meaningful life. I, I live a very, very privileged and meaningful life. Although I struggle hugely with sensory overload, I think that I have crafted huge coping mechanisms that allow me to go into these situations. Although I might hate it, although I might struggle, I can come across just as anybody else does. I am also somebody that actively tries to improve myself. I have great self-awareness. I acknowledge my strengths. I acknowledge my... <laughs> She goes, I have self, I have great self-awareness. I think this can come off like really arrogant and narcissistic to a lot of people because if a neurotypical person said it, they would be boasting. But because she's autistic, she's probably just stating like how she perceives herself. Like it's not necessarily that it's a fact, but it's how she perceives herself. She like, I am self-aware, she states very proudly. Not, you know, it. there's a difference I think here. And this is what I think really throws everybody off is like, are you bragging or are you just stating a thing that's true to you? It doesn't mean that it's true totally, but it's just true to you because that's the difference, right? Now, I think ultimately that that, yeah, like pff, Tori says that's such an autistic thing to say. It's such an autistic thing to say. I love to hear it, honestly challenges and I'm always striving to do better, to learn more, to be a better person, a, be a better version of myself. And despite the misconceptions and the stereotypes, I do have deep empathy for people. And this is why my friends, I do not look autistic. I guess the point mm. of this video from She's feeling alienated and she doesn't know her bubble. I'm assuming this is what she's, this is what I'm assuming she's telling us, right? I'm not telling her what she's, I'm that's what I'm getting from the video. Right. And so she's kind of like signaling to the world that she isn't being treated the way she notices other people who are autistic are being treated. And that has its benefits and its disadvantages. For me was to really cater to those of us on the spectrum who are struggling to find their place in the world, where they fit in, whether that's with neurotypicals, whether it's not. I really just want to cater to, to those of us who honestly are the plain James. Overall, I think when you don't look. Habibi, I'm gonna hold my hand, uh, your hand when I say this, okay? What's her name, Elena? Elena, is that her name? Elena, I'm gonna hold your hand when I say this. Look at your apartment. Now look at your tattoo choices. Are you sure you don't look autistic? <laughs> are you sure about that? Are you absolutely positive? Are you sure about that? I don't know. I don't know. Those pillow decisions, those tattoo decisions. I mean, even getting tattoos in general, I look at everyone with tattoos like they could be on the spectrum or they could be neurodivergent. Because ma'am, Maggie with the super chat says, I also feel as if I don't fit the autism bubble. No, there is exactly, there is no, thank you for the super chat. There is no autism bubble. There's only autism bubbles. There are thousands, maybe millions of autism bubbles. And that's the issue. There is no autism bubble. There are autism bubbles. So either she needs to find a different autism bubble or, you know, 
She's got to figure it out because I mean, I know so many autistic girls that look like this. So many of them. And yes, they are assumed to be neurotypical because people just think they're like, oh, the like cute punk girl or the cute um, uh, manic pixie girl, but that isn't autistic or the cute artist girl. Think about it. Even the concept of tattoos, it's such a neurodivergent thing to do. Not literally, not literally. Okay, guys. But to even get a tattoo is to deviate from the norm. The norm fits in. The nerd typical is not interested in standing out. That's why there's a stereotype of blue hair and nose piercings and tattoos is autistic or progressive, right? Not because they are, not because tattoos mean neurodivergent, but usually if you have the kind of brain that is already rebelling against the norm, there might be some something in that. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying it could be. There seems to be some relationship with willingness to dress alternative that says I'm willing to be, I'm willing to stand out. With that said, let's see. She's almost done. Let's finish out the video. Autistic to the world, the most important relationship that you can have is with yourself and trusting yourself, trusting your emotions, trusting your sensory overwhelm and knowing that when you need to get out of a situation, when you need to share the autism diagnosis with somebody, just trust in yourself, trust that you know what's best for you because nobody else, nobody fucking else can say anything. No one knows the struggles that you go through on a daily basis. That's all I've got to say today. I just really hope that this resonates with just one person because it, it was just something that I've been sitting with for a while now. But thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you'd like to connect with I think what's interesting too is like, hey. she's very pretty. She's very, 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 very pretty in a conventional way, which would make neurotypicals look past her alternative aesthetic. And I think that plays a huge role as well is if a neuro, if a regular, like a person who's fitting into society, let's say a really normal preppy person, like there are just people who will never date this girl simply because she has tattoos. So let's move them out of the category. Then there's people who are willing to date people with tattoos that are conventionally pretty because it excuses the aesthetic, right? Okay, once again, I'm so sorry. I'm watching that realtor show and there's this douchebag on the show that I just absolutely dislike and I know he's a real person and I'm sorry, but your tattoos and fuckboy hair is so unattractive to me. I would never buy a house through you. Thank you. And people that are willing to do business with you obviously are douchebags. I said what I said. So I'm looking at him. He's got a motorcycle and fuckboy hair and he takes shots and he's working 24 seven and he's got tattoos and he's the rebel of real estate. He's not wearing a suit. Ooh, he stands out he's the next generation i hate him his aesthetic i hate his aesthetic sorry i hate his i don't know the consciousness i hate the aesthetic it's like it sends warning signals to my brain as like ew and i was right because he gossips and he's mean on the show and he's very narcissistic not npd damn it i did it he's very egoistic he's very in his ego i don't like it anyways with that said he stands out but it's probably not because he's autistic probably because he's a douchebag and he wants to think he's the main character. He's got main character syndrome. So, okay. Now her level of pretty is exceptionally like pretty. She's very pretty, right? So she's going to invite a lot of people into her sphere of interest just because she's pretty, but a lot of people still won't date her simply because she has tattoos. And then there's so much more that goes into this, but let's just finish it out for, to make sure I didn't miss anything in the last 10 seconds. And then we'll have a combo. If you'd like to watch more of my content, I will leave my other social medias down below. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day or night. Wherever you do, I'll subscribe. I'll like the video. We'll see where she's going to go with this. Elena Carroll. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Cop, uh, comment says you don't look autistic. Everyone is on the spectrum. I die a little inside every time I hear those. This video generally means so much as a extremely high masking female autistic. You encapu encapsulated my experience exactly. And it feels so nice to have someone to relate. That's great. Commenter said I relate as somebody who is legally blind, but I don't look blind. Invisible disabilities are a struggle and exhausting. You have to explain yourself constantly. True. Great. I'm glad people are relating because I can see this being very relatable to a lot of people. Discord says we're noted. Uh, no, no, no. Discord said, hold on. I think this is about being conventionally attractive. It's pretty gross that the perception exists that being conventionally attractive means anything beyond your appearance fitting into that box. We're noticing style over physical features, which is a better way to read a person since it's more likely to align with the choice versus genetics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Walk Away Man says she just doesn't fit the neurotypical idea of someone who is neurodivergent, or maybe even sometimes the neurodivergent doesn't fit the neurodivergent. It's hard to say. So I would say that ultimately, if you're in a certain bubble and you stand out in general, you're fitting, you like people are animals observing other animals. And we're just trying to figure out who is this person and what box do they fit into? And how does it make sense? Someone actually said to me recently that they've noticed that if people get frustrated with me, it's because they can't box me very easily. And I can imagine that's pretty frustrating because everyone neurodivergent or neurotypical is trying to make sure they properly assess people around them so they know what to do next. As as autistic as that sounds to script out interactions, neurotypical people are also having relationships with this where they're trying to play social games, they're trying to properly react in situations, they're trying to say the right thing at the right time. So there is something to that that I think is interesting and it must be very frustrating because you know, you, you have an assessment of somebody and then you're wrong. And so that hits your ego or worse, you have an assessment of yourself and then it, you know, you're wrong and it hurts your ego. So I would say this is probably a, a generally pretty universal experience. But then on top of that, the more individualistic person versus community person is probably going to feel more alienated because there's not a community to latch on to that reflects you back to you. I really genuinely feel, and this is just my opinion, if you find yourself never really clicking with a bubble, it's okay to make a bubble. It's okay to have an environment in which you recognize that you are more of an individual person than a community person, and an individual person can still be a temporary community person. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being that person. I just think we sell in alternative communities, though in every community, we're a community. You can rely on us. We'll come visit you. Church communities do this. School communities do this. Group communities do this online. The dilemma, once again, is working with people is great, but it will be messy. You're doing a lot of emotional labor, right? And sometimes I think neurodivergents put a lot of pressure on themselves to be community members. Just a reminder that you are going to be doing lots of emotional labor. The more people that are in your sphere, the more people you have to deal with. And I don't know if you are, you know that's the choice you're making. Because there is this, I think, I don't know, some narrative that's been sold to some bubbles that like, oh, community is everything. Community is great. Community is a responsibility though. You're doing emotional labor for your community. It's why a lot of people end up kind of like becoming more like hermit because at the end of the day, yeah, it's hard enough. Like, look, uh, this is how you know you're neurodivergent, okay? When you ask yourself what tasks you got done that day and brushing your teeth and taking a shower were a part of the list or you're chronically ill. When I write down the list of things I accomplished in a day, I write, washed my face, brushed my teeth, took my shower, spoon, spoon, spoon. And then I go uh, exercise, spoon, everything you do is like you're writing it down. Imagine a person who wakes up and doesn't count any of these things as a task. Like they wouldn't even think about them. Like, of course, going to work, task, commuting to work, task. And they just see it in their head as like nothing. A task to them is the stuff they do outside of their regular tasks. So I know people that are so like neurotypical, so like specifically functional, okay? Not functional in a judgmental or non-judgmental way. We're going to work, brushing their teeth, doing all that stuff is just the day. And then everything extra, like, oh, we have an extra school meeting today. Okay, that's a task. Or we have an extra thing today. Okay, that's a task. So again, know yourself, know your limitations and know what you can give. Because if brushing your teeth is considered a task to you, now imagine doing emotional labor for your community on top of that. Because that's a lot of, that's a lot of responsibility. And you're not obligated to do it. So if you're feeling like you need a bubble, you can always make one. If you want to visit communities temporarily or full-time, that's up to you. Discord says that was a huge lesson I had to learn. Brittany, emotional labor is no joke. It's so crazy to think people don't see it that way. You know, I think that's why... It's really difficult when, oh, we're going to talk about entitlement later because there's a video I have on my list of, about entitlement. I don't know what it's about, but that's why entitlement is so scary and dangerous sometimes. Like people think that they're entitled to you doing their emotional labor, which is why it's always great to have, again, like people in your life that will understand like, hey, like I can't do this, but it's not about you. It's about my limitations. Like during COVID when my friends were like, they needed therapy. And I said, hey, I think you need a therapist. I can't do this emotional labor. It sounds like you need a professional. And they just went and got therapy. That's a type of symbiosis with your with your community. If your community is constantly calling you, calling you, calling you, but they're not reaching out to the professionals you can pay 
or go to to help them with things your friends can't, then I think that that's the burden that becomes so difficult, right? Oh, Candace says, I wonder if this is why I feel so unaccomplished most days because I do have living tasks, brushing teeth, eating meals, getting out of bed, but not the capitalist success tasks like finishing projects, probably. I would start, what I do is I make a list of things that made me feel a little slightly exhausted and I start to write down how many spoons everything took, right? And I start to ask myself like, was this easy to make? Like today, I, okay, you know how I've been eating sea bass for the last, who knows, I've been eating it consistently for like a pretty long time. Well, I woke up yesterday and I decided I can't, I can't do it. I don't want to, I don't want the texture. I mean, I, I can't do it. So today my partner was like, well, what do you want me to get you from the store? Cause like he does the grocery shopping. And I was like, oh, um, okay. I was like, I'm open to carrots and broccoli and I'm open to Brussels sprouts and I'm open to chicken nuggets. And he said, okay, but what if they don't have those? And I was like, uh, the, uh. and then like I sat there and I'm like, okay. So then, cause our store is kind of tiny. It doesn't always have everything. So then we make plan B's and C's for foods I can have. But in order to know what kind of food I want, I have to imagine eating it first and think about how that makes my body feel. And if I feel nauseous, I won't like it. And if I feel okay, then I choose that. So today I had broccoli and carrots with cheese and salami baked on top of it. It was really good. And in chicken nuggets. And that was my food today. And even thinking about how I felt about what I was gonna eat felt exhausting. And I was like, man, that made me tired. I still end up doing my work and I still end up doing everything. But even like that's, just, those are how the conversations go. And also I just, <laughs> It's kind of amazing, like all of these things. You know, the thought spot, Irene said the funniest thing in a video. I was watching her review New Girl from an autistic perspective. And uh, she was talking about like all those like thoughts in your head that you say out loud. And my partner and I do that where like when I say we tell each other every thought we have, it's more like what if whales could talk to us and one day we'll be able to talk to them. It's like those types of things. When I say like I have a partner and we just share all of our thoughts, I mean like we're sitting in a room and we're like, could, do you think you could scale down from this building? Like, do you think you could get down to the ground floor? What if there's a fire in the hallway? Like we spent most of our day just what ifing. What if this happens? Okay, but what if this happened? And that starts so many conversations that lead us to learning so much about each other. Oh, how, you th how do you think about this? What goes first? What about this? Even food. People just think, oh, what sounds good? And I think, how will that feel in my mouth? How will that feel swallowing? How's that gonna feel in my body in two hours? I don't just think like what sounds good to eat. I think, how am I gonna feel while eating it? And that's just, the again, it's not, it's not because you're worse or better that you're different. It doesn't matter. It's just saying, this is your category. Red is not better than blue. It's just saying, do you know the difference if you're blue or if you're red? <laughs> Kay says, that's how I eat. It's a whole process. Got to eat mentally before I eat physically to see if I will be able to actually eat. Mm -hmm. It's not about saying like, oh, you're bad because you're this or you're good because you're this. It's just saying, oh, well, I'm red. So I have these needs and I'm blue and I have these needs and I got to figure that out. You're just putting yourself and you're just examining yourself in a correct way to give yourself the correct response. And I think people are so disconnected from themselves that once they start doing that, it just feels so much more exhausting because you realize, you know, you were disassociating for most of your life probably. And so you didn't even realize all of these things were happening, let me tell you. All right, great video. I'm glad we watched it. Good conversation. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, da, da.